This is part two of a three-part course in what we call Modern Errors. The first part of Modern Errors concerns the history of error, uh, how and why uh, all Vatican II happened, everything that led up to Vatican II historically, starting with the Renaissance and the Reformation. And this second part is a look at modern philosophy, which is a very much a contribution to the errors of Vatican II. Uh, the, the idea of Vatican II was to uh, make the world, uh, make the church conform to the modern world, to update the church, to make it more acceptable to the modern world. Uh, and so the modern world is loaded with the ideas of modern philosophy. And in order to understand Vatican II and its errors, you must understand modern philosophy. The third part of modern errors is modern theological errors, the, the errors of the modernists. And this is taught in a, in a different year. So here we are, we are in part two of modern errors, which is philosophical errors. So there is in, in modern philosophy a general theme, which is empiricism versus idealism. All right. These are the two main errors of modern philosophy, and they are opposed one to another. empiricism and idealism. But before you can understand that, we have to talk about human knowledge a little bit. Human knowledge is a marriage, in a certain sense, of subject and object. The subject is the knowing faculty, that is the intellect. The object is the thing as it exists in reality. These two things must come together in knowledge. We may compare subject and object to the operation of a camera. Now I'm talking about older cameras where there was actually a physical film. The film is of course the subject. The film receives the light from the object and reproduces it. It captures the object, the, the person or the thing that you're taking a picture of, and makes it its own. See, so the, the object is, is taken in, is captured by the subject, the film. Clearly, the object does not physically enter the camera. So the, the person that you're taking a picture of does not get into the camera, obviously. But the union takes place in a different way. And this different way is by accurate representations of the object. These representations caused by light enter the camera to which the film is sensitive. Now this is the old style of camera. The combination of the sensitive film and the representations of the camera, like potency and act, form a picture. So the, the thing on the outside, a person, gets into the camera by representations through light. And the film captures it and in a way reproduces it. You have it in your camera. And this is also true of digital cameras, in just a different way. It reproduces it, it has it, you see? And this we call the object, and this we call the subject. 
And since the object is what causes the reproduction in the camera, we say that this is act, that is, it's active, it, it causes, and that this is passive or potency because it receives, it has the ability to receive. So if you have no film on your camera, it won't work because it has no potency to receive. So the, the, also in the intellect, the object is active, it causes the reception of the object in a representational manner in the intellect. And so we say the object is active, the intellect is a potency, it is passive, it receives. It has the power to receive. And when these two things come together, when subject and object come together, you have knowledge. This is the classical, what we call scholastic explanation of knowledge. The philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, the philosophy of the church, and Aristotle, etc. This is, and truth occurs, the definition of truth is the conformity of the representation to the exterior object. If, if this is correct, then you have truth. Now suppose you had bad film or something was wrong with your camera, the representation might be faulty. So then you don't have truth because it does not match the object. But if the representation matches the object, then you have truth. And we call that objective truth. All of this makes common sense. I mean, you, you, you don't have to be very intelligent to figure this out. It's just modern philosophy is going to contradict all of this. So we might say that there is a bridge between subject, the intellect, and object. You see, there is a connection between these two things because the one, the intellect, is made to know the object. And so they, they are nicely connected. And that's how you have knowledge. What modern philosophy did was to blow up the bridge and say either it, with empiricism that, excuse me, with empiricism All we know, uh, we, we don't have any true knowledge of the object. All we have is sense knowledge, like the animals. We don't understand the essence of things, what their nature is. But we just see things and we give labels to them, just like animals do in a way. They see things, they remember them, they, they have purely sensitive knowledge. That's empiricism. So it exaggerates the object too much and it, it takes away from the subject, the ability of the subject to receive an essence. Because when we know something, we're not merely seeing it with our eyes and hearing it with our ears, but we are determining what the essence is of the object. What is essence? Essence is the nature of a thing. What the thing is. Essence answers the question, what is it? So it's not merely to see colors or to see objects with your eyes. It is to, to take in the essence of something. And we know that that's true because we use terms all over the world and everybody knows the same, has the same concept for that term. So if I say cat or dog all over the world, no matter what language I say it in, 
you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have formed a, an image of that nature in your head, in your, not in your brain, but in your intellect. And you should understand the difference between those two things. Your brain merely collects the sense knowledge, the images, either from your eyes or your ears or touch, uh, smell, anything at all uh, in, that pertains to sense knowledge. It takes it and organizes it into a big picture, we might say, a complete picture of what is outside. But it is your intellect that selects from that picture, which we call the phantasm, your intellect, which is a spiritual thing, which is uh, uh, an immaterial spiritual thing, which sees the essence in the data that is brought in by the senses and given to the brain. You see? So you must distinguish the brain from the intellect. The brain merely collects and organizes the sense knowledge and presents it to the intellect. It's the intellect that knows the nature of things. It is not the brain. However, it is true that the intellect is very dependent on the brain for information. And that's why when you have brain damage, you can't know things, and, or it's very difficult to know things. Your cognitive abilities are, are slower because your intellect is, is absolutely passive. It's like a movie screen that simply waits for information from the brain. So if the brain is not working well, your cognitive faculties also are not working well. It's like a camera that has a broken lens or the, 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 the camera sees through the lens and so your intellect sees through the brain and the senses. All right, so, uh, so it, the, the intellect is very dependent on the brain but it, it, it is not the brain that knows things. Uh, the brain is only capable of sensitive knowledge. That means knowledge of things as they appear or as they are heard but cannot see the essence or nature of things the way the intellect can. And that's why human beings speak, they give speeches, they have information, and animals don't speak. All the animal does is make noises that show pain or pleasure or uh, something, some sort of emotional uh, uh, emotion that it is having, but they do not speak to each other. They do not speak the way human beings speak with words that evoke concepts. <clears throat> so, when people look at photographs, they ask about people in the picture saying, who is that? The answer is the name of a certain person as if the picture were of the, of, were the person himself. In other words, who is that? You say, that's John Doe. You don't say, well, this is just a piece of paper with ink on it. See, what you're looking at in the photograph is the object, John Doe, your relative. You're, you're not merely looking at paper with ink on it. You see an object. Therefore, we may distinguish in the object its real being, that is, John Doe in the flesh, and its representational being, that is John Doe as he is represented in the picture. And so your intellect, in that sense, takes a picture of the object, and so the object has what we call a representational being in your intellect. We also say that this is that the, the intellect's picture of John Doe is vicarious, that means it's representational, it's a vicarious being, in as much as the picture is the vicar of the object as it exists in reality. <clears throat> we may use the example of the rear view mirror in a car. When we look in the rear view mirror as we are driving, the object of our knowledge is primarily and directly the image in the mirror. You're looking at essentially light in the mirror. That's all it is, is light. However, that light is an image of what is behind you. So you don't say, 
there is a truck in the mirror, you say there's a truck behind me because the mirror is merely reflecting the reality. You, you don't concentrate on, on the image as it is, but you concentrate on what the image is referring to. That is, some object in reality. So you don't change lanes or you move over, whatever you need to do, based on that vicarious and representational knowledge that the, that the mirror provides for you. <clears throat> From these examples, we garner that in order for knowledge to take place, the object as it exists in reality must in some way be subjectivized. That is, it must in some way be taken in by the subject and given a different kind of existence by the subject. The intellect must produce its own image of the thing outside. So it subjectivizes. Now that word, you shouldn't understand that to mean that it obscures it in some way or changes it in some way. It, it is totally objective, but it exists in a different way. The object exists in a subjective way that is the, the type of existence that it has in your mind. But it, is, it doesn't lose any of its objectivity because your mind gives it a different kind of life, we might say. It's always referring back, just as your rearview mirror is always going to and infallibly show what is behind you. But what's in your rearview mirror is merely light. So the, the, the object, the physical object, is subjectivized in the rearview mirror. It receives light beams from it, and you see the, the, what is there. <clears throat> So that means, it means that the, the object as it is outside must be made palatable for the spiritual intellect. It must be spiritualized. But at the same time, in order to be true, it must remain objective. That is, it must be truly representative of what is outside. Philosophical truth consists in rendering to each, that is, subject and object, what is its due. Our Lord said, render therefore to Caesar what is Caesar's. And, and, and so also, uh, and what is God's, uh, what pertains to God, we give to God. So we render to the subject what pertains to the subject and what pertains to the object, we, we give to the object. That is sound philosophy that the, the object has certain characteristics, the subject has certain characteristics, we observe both of those, that is sound philosophy. That is common sense philosophy. <clears throat> if there is an imbalance on one side or the other where we emphasize the subject too much and that will be idealism, that is, where the subject makes up things about the object, uh, actually, actually manufactures ideas on its own about the object, that's idealism. And that means an excessive emphasis of the subject. If on the other hand, the subject only knows sense knowledge and you emphasize the object too much, so that you make the subject basically animal knowledge, all right, then you are erring on the side of the object. And the uh, error will result from that. All philosophical error can be traced to an undue accentuation of either subject or object. Thus, we divide the errors into two general categories. Empiricism, which is the impoverishment of the subject. And on the other hand, idealism, which is the impoverishment of the object. So the object in, in, in idealism is merely suggestive to your, to your mind. It's only an experience. 
You, you don't actually receive the object. It simply activates your mind to think what you want to think. That's idealism. So it loses objectivity. When the intellect knows an object, it strips the object of its individuating principles, such as matter, accidents, and circumstances. So if I see a cow, my intellect is going to strip away its color, it's going to strip away where it is, it's going to, to uh, take away even its matter, it's going to look at what makes a cow to be a cow. How is a cow distinguished from a dog? See, so it is going to look at certain essential points in the animal to distinguish one from the other. And so it, there, there is this we call abstraction. So when we say the word cow, that concept in my mind could apply to any cow in the whole world, no matter what its circumstances are, where it is, what color it is, what breed it is, it's a cow. Because the intellect is seeking essence. When the intellect has taken a picture, as I said, of something, it is so stripped of its singular qualities that it could apply to anything which has the same nature. And so, as I said, cow could apply to any cow in the whole world. The term cat could apply to the big cats of the jungle or to the tiny little kittens that we see in a home. It's all cat. This process of abstraction is essential to human knowledge since it is the basis of all meaning and communication. The reason why we can speak to each other is that my words are evoking concepts in your mind that you already have if I speak about cat, dog, etc., those have been formed years ago in your mind and you know exactly what they are. I could say that, I could say cat and dog in many different languages, but they all mean and point to the same concept. And so communication of human beings throughout the whole world is possible because of that uh, unity of essence of natural things. <clears throat> So if we did not all have the same concept of cat, it would be mean meaningless to use the term cat, for it could just as easily refer to a dog or to a gorilla. Thus the mind tends to make one what is in reality many. There are many, many cows, but your mind reduces the, the, the many cows to one cow, that is, one essential cow. <clears throat> we call this abstract cow, uh, which is applied to many cows, a universal. The universal is perfect, it is abstract, and it never changes. The term cow has been used since the beginning of, of humankind. Now, if we reflect upon this unifying and universalizing tendency of the intellect, we can understand the error of idealism, which imposes upon the real object the abstractions of the intellect. So idealism means that the, the subject is actually becomes active and it imposes upon the object what it thinks where there's no basis for its thinking in the object. And this is the basis of all of this nonsense today about transgenderism. Today I am identifying as a male or as a female or something else because it's all subjectivist. See, in reality, you cannot change your gender. It's impossible. Biologically, you're male or female. But, see, that doesn't matter for the idealist because the object does not matter. It's what I think, what I feel that matters. 
So you could change from day to day, back and forth between male and female. See, uh, uh, that's a very typical of the, the subjectivist thinking. Also, all of the relativism in morality, that I can do whatever I please, essentially, comes from this idea. That there's no natural law, there's no objective natural law to which I must conform myself. Rather, it's what I think and, and what, what, what my impressions are, my experience. See, so that you can see the modern error in that. <clears throat> uh, it gets into ecumenism also, you see. There's no objective truth to which one must conform. No one single religion which Christ has founded. Rather, it's all what you think about God and your personal experiences about God. That's idealism in action. On the other hand, the real object is material, singular, individual, and changeable. So if we go back to the cow, it's all of those things. It's a single cow. It has matter. It's an individual cow, and it's a changeable cow. It can drop dead. If we reflect upon these qualities of the real object, we can understand the error of empiricism, which is to impose upon the intellect the singularity and changeability of the material object. So empiricism is going to say, you have no knowledge of the essence of things. All you do is, is you see things and you put labels on them just in a way, the same way an animal does. An animal remembers, a cat remembers a dog, etc. Uh, it has a, what we call a sensitive memory. It has a, an image memory. And so empiricism destroys objective truth because all you know is, is sense knowledge. There's no connection between the thing and essence in your mind. There is no abstraction of the essence from the thing. It's all just sense knowledge. So it, it ruins objective truth because there is no, the bridge is blown up. If you blow up the bridge, there's no objective truth because truth consists in the conformity of the subject to the object. See, so if there's no conformity, if that bridge is blown up, you have no knowledge and you have no truth. No objective truth which is the only kind of truth. <clears throat> Both errors destroy knowledge, for they destroy the marriage of subject and object, the bridge. They truly divorce subject from object. Idealism does this by removing from the intellect its true object, that is, the thing in reality and substituting for it the very productions of the intellect itself. My experience, my ideas. Uh, Immanuel Kant, which we will see later, will call it his categories. So you have an experience. You, 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 you don't even know if your experience is real or not, but you have an experience. And then you categorize this experience and give it certain a certain reality in your mind. That's all that counts is that it's real for you. It's true for you. But it may not be true for someone else. And that's what happens to truth in this thing. And you can see how that affects ecumenism, Vatican II, uh, all of the immorality that is now permitted. There's nothing objective. The... They divorce subject and object. Uh, idealism does this by removing from the intellect its true object, the thing in reality, and substituting for it the very productions of the intellect itself. It would be the equivalent of the camera producing its own images on the film, regardless of what you pointed the camera at. So you might point your camera at a cow, and what you get is a dog, because the camera has the experience of a dog. What would you do with that camera? You'd throw it out. But that 
detachment from the object helps people to decide what, what is moral and what is immoral on their own. If, if something pleases me, well, then I think it's moral. It, it, it's, it's whatever my experience is. This is my interior experience. So it, it is corrosive of all morality. <clears throat> Empiricism, on the other hand, destroys knowledge by denying to the intellect its power to abstract and therefore to know. It would be like a camera which had no film or very poor film in such a way that it would be impossible to tell who is in the picture. In this dual error lies the ancient battle of the one and the many. In ancient Greece, there were two main lines of thought. One empiricist, emphasizing the changeability of material things, and the other idealist, emphasizing the oneness of the abstract idea. Heraclitus was born in Ephesus in about the year 530. He firmly believed in the principle that since everything material is subject to change and motion, the human mind is deceived if it thinks that anything is permanent. So he would deny essence, that something has a, a permanent principle in it to make it to be what it is. In other words, he would say nothing is, but rather everything is becoming. Nothing is what it is. It's becoming something all the time. Hence it is said of Heraclitus, that he accentuated the many, the singular, the material, and considered the mind's attempt <clears throat> to unify and universalize as futile and false. The knowledge of an unchanging essence would be impossible for him. These principles are the fundamental principles of modern empiricism. Parmenides, on the other hand, was born in Elea in about 540 BC, so they are contemporaries. He taught an error contrary to that of Heraclitus. He distrusted sense knowledge and held that the truth lies in thought. He confused the mind's abstraction from being, <coughs> from everything which exists, that is, being with a small b, with subsistent being, with a big b, that is, the infinite eternal being of God. <coughs> so he confused the eternal and infinite being of God with the being of individual things. He concluded, therefore, that all being is one, since everything is being and therefore he was a pantheist. <clears throat> Everything is God. Everything is one. And we'll see that in the idealist uh, side of modern errors. <clears throat> the contradiction between these two early philosophers will be felt throughout the ages down to the present time. This war, so to speak, between these two errors we therefore divide modern philosophical errors into empiricism and idealism according as they e either impoverish the powers of the mind to know an abstract reality from sense knowledge, and that's empiricism, or impoverish the knowability of the object, reducing all knowledge to the inventions and embellishments of the intellect. <clears throat>